your traditions of a Pharisee. The, the traditions you have of religion make this worthless. Your traditions as a Catholic, as a Baptist, as a Methodist, as a Pentecostal, your traditions as one, your traditions rob the life out of this. Yes. Yes. And when he would hear tradition robbing people, it burned in him. It's a work of the enemy. I don't treat it nicely. Everybody has a right to their own opinion. Then keep it to yourself. Amen. You're stealing other people. Right. You're stealing their dreams. If you want to be negative about life, be negative about life. But don't take other people down with you. Amen. Don't tell people they can't do what you haven't done. Mm. It's amazing to me that I found that nobody who's ever been healed by the power of God believes that it was simply a circumstance. People say, well, Pastor, I don't believe it's God's will to heal everybody. I know one thing about you. You've never been healed by the power of God. Because if you have and made that statement, we're going to say, well, what was so special about you? Well, why do he heal you? Oh, I don't know. I'm better than you. No, you wouldn't say that. Well, more people prayed for me than I got the prayer tower and everybody else. No, no, no. Anybody that knows that God healed them physically knows, my goodness, in that healing, they understand God will heal anybody. Say, I know God will save anybody. Wow, I got saved. <laughs> now, I might have thought not everybody got saved, could get saved before, but once I got saved, I realized anybody can get saved. Anybody, I mean, I, you, you cannot out sin the love of God. You know? But see, if you're not saved, you don't know that. But once you're saved, you don't go around saying, well, it's not God's will to save everybody. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You, you know that when you get born again. My goodness, if God saved me, He'll save you. Same for healing. Well, if God healed me, he'll... Well, guess what? If God blessed me financially, He'll bless you. Yes. God, God didn't bless me financially because of my brains. Well, you know, you just have the right opportunities. God gave them to me. Yes. <laughs> I didn't make them. Mm -hmm. See, I don't know of anyone who's been financially blessed by God who, who doesn't know that God will bless anybody. I know people have a lot of money who don't believe every penny can have money. I know a lot of wealthy people who inherited it and therefore don't think you can ever have wealth because you can't possibly inherit it. Your name's not right. But anybody that has seen God bring money into their life knows that if God brought money into their life, He can bring money into anybody's life. Because it's a godly principle. Does this make some sense to you? And David rises up with this, this indignation. You've got to get indignant about loss in your life. You've got to, got to get indignant when you can't pay your bills. This is not how a child of God should live. You don't get mad at God. You get mad at the devil who's been stealing from you. you got to get indignant when he takes your kids. you got to get indignant when he takes your health. you got to get indignant about things. You get to the point where you walk down the street and you see somebody walking by with disease and it stirs up in you. That's not right. That's not the work of my God. Amen. You get stirred up like that, things will begin to happen in your life. Mm -hmm. It rose up in David. The whole army of God backing off because of one man that doesn't have a covenant? Come on, give me a break. Mm -hmm. Too many Christians are passive. Isn't that a shame? Let's just pray. God, let your will be done. God's already told you what his will is. Yes. You've got to be quick about it when somebody in the world says, well, you know, God had a purpose for taking that young person's life. My God doesn't take children's lives. I defy you to find that in the Bible. God said very simply, listen, which of you as an earthly father, if your son asks for a fish, would give him a snake? How much more does your heavenly father want to give you good things? Give good things. He, he's not giving bad things. Jeremiah, the verse we use here a lot. I, you, you don't know the plans I have. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Where, do, where does God come off with a bad rap? You've got to come to the point where you just get indignant about the things in your life that you're still carrying around. Indignant about things in your past and get them out of your life. And until you get stirred up about it, it's not going to drop off. Until you get, get a, a, a holy passion. I was made for more than this. And you were. The Bible calls you a saint. The Bible calls you a child of the king. The Bible calls you an ambassador for Christ. What is an ambassador doing living in poverty? See, we read it through religious eyes, but well, wait a minute. You wouldn't go to President Bush and say, I want to be an ambassador, and then you get over in the place and you can't pay your light bill, and you can't eat because you don't have enough food. You say, hey, 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 wait a minute. 
I'm the ambassador for the United States and I'm living here in poverty in Ghana because you can't give me enough money? Something's wrong! It's not right that the ambassador of the United States drive around in a broken two-tone rust car. I'm driving around in the best to describe to the people around here how great my country is. It's not right that our leadership not have the best. It's not right. You're going to get that in you. It's not right as a Christian. not right for me to live defeat. It's not right for me to be this. I have had times when I've been down in the dumps and discouraged and it would rise up in me. This is not right. I'm better than this. What am I doing wallowing in the mud? Get out of here and find out how to get myself up and move forward. It's not right that a child of God should not be on top. And until indignation would stir in me, I'd sit there. And there's too many passive Christians and David was not a passive person. Pace setters are not passive people. Pay setters start with an indignation. The second thing that a pace setter is going to learn if they're going to be an overcomer here is not only indignation, but motivation. you got, you got to find out what's going to motivate. And, and I love what David found here because what he says in verse 25, now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father, his father's family from taxes. In Israel, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills his Philistine? And they tell him again. See, indignation was one thing, but motivation is another thing. Motivation to receive goes along with the indignation. I, I believe that the motivation that Jesus had was the healing he could see that was going to take place. Indignant that, that Satan had bound somebody and the motivation is, I see them free. I'm motivated by that. I, I get highly motivated by your success. See, if I can't see you successful, there's no motivation. When you come in and you tell me what God's done to your life, I say, tell me again. What do you do? What do you do? That's the value of our testimony. Why? It's very motivating. Amen? And David doesn't come up with it. this great little spiritual thing. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. I'm going to go serve Jesus. No, he comes out and he says, what did you say? I mean, he's already indignant, and then he hears there's a reward. Isn't it amazing that Christians don't want to talk about rewards? God's not embarrassed by talking about rewards. Not in the least. The man who kills Goliath the king will give him great wealth. Not just wealth, great wealth. It's going to give him his daughter in marriage. I imagine David must have said to somebody, have you seen the king's daughter? <laughs> <laughs> what does she look like? <laughs> <laughs> that could be motivating or not. <laughs> yeah. and, and his father's land free from taxes. Yes. I mean, if I said, I, you want, I want you to sell out to Jesus, and you say, what's in it for me? Great wealth. And you'll never pay a dollar again to the IRS. That alone would motivate some of you. <laughs> you know, no more money to the IRS? Yes! <laughs> Motivation. What is the reward? Hebrews 11.6. You don't need to turn that. You know that. Because it talks about the one that comes to God must believe that He exists. That makes sense. But it doesn't stop there. And that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. See, too many Christians stop at the first part. Well, if you're going to be a Christian and walk in the power of God, you've got to believe He exists. Yeah. And that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. I've got to believe that. That's what the Bible says faith is. Believing that. And if I'm not seeing the reward, then either He lied or the only other verb in there is diligent. <laughs> I must not have been diligently. It's actually not a verb, it's an adverb. Diligently seeking Him. So I work on my diligence and I let him work on the reward. Amen? Yes. Indignation must be part of being an overcomer. Dissatisfaction with where you are. If you're not thoroughly dissatisfied, you won't change. Tell the story of the frog in the rut. As he's hopping down that Georgia rut down there, and his friend frog sees him down there and says, Hey, what are you doing down there? I got stuck in a rut. Well, jump out. Oh, I've jumped. I've jumped. 
I've gone to jumping seminars. I've gone to overcoming jumping seminars. I've gone to the women's jumping seminar and the men's jumping seminar. And I can't jump out of this rut. It's too deep. It's me. I've been in this way too long. You just got to understand this is my life. And six hours later, his friend Frog's jumping along and he sees that frog. Not in the rut anymore. He's out on the side of the road. He says, hey! How'd you get out? He said, well, a truck came down the rut and I had to get out. <laughs> Motivation. <laughs> Motivation. Motivation. Motiv See, the reason... The, the, the reason people don't deal with things is because they think they can put up with it. I've seen people in a job for five years that they should have left four years earlier, but they put up with it for those four years, thinking it's going to change. Hey, and finally one day they quit. What happened? Well, it got so bad. Well, was it always bad yet? Well, why were you sticking around when it was bad? Why didn't you fix it then? Why didn't you draw a line and say, look, either this changes or I'm out of here? Amen? I tell that to young women all the time. You know, they'll go with a young man and they'll say, I'll say, well, when's he going to change? Well, he'll change later. No, he won't. Draw a line in the sand. Hey, Buster, you either change now or I'm out of here. I'm not hanging around for six years while you try to get your act together. You know, I, I'm, hello. I, I'm, that's, amen. I, I, and I'm certainly not going to get in and then six years later have to get a divorce. Why'd you have to get a divorce? Because you didn't say no six years earlier when it was bad. You thought, well, I'll tolerate the bad. It doesn't get better. Mm -hmm. right. Tolerating sickness does not get you well. It sets you up for more serious sicknesses. Mm -hmm. Tolerating poverty and lack does not make you prosperous. You cannot cut your way back to prosperity. Amen? There's got to be some motivation. There's got to be something to get you moving in there. So you got in indignation and you're finally just fed up with where you are and you things have got to change. I can't spend another year like this. I'm meant to be more than this. And now I've got some motivation. Because I find out there's a place I can be. There's things I can have. There's a change that can take place in my life. But you still need something else. It's called recognition. In verse 37, Saul has said to David, listen, you're too young. You can't go do these things. Actually, let's pick it up. Uh, yeah, verse 37. David has just told Saul about the deliverance from the lion and the bear when he was out in the sheepfold, and he makes this statement. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He had to recognize a greater power to set him free. The Lord who delivered me there will deliver me here. See, I, I, I'm indignant about where I am. And I'm motivated to get out, but I'm trying to do it on my own. You know that old expression, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? Back when people wore these long boots like this and they had straps on them. And, and that's how you got them on. You grab that strap and pulled it in. But you can't pull yourself up by those. How, how are you going to do that? Not the army sergeant who said, all right, all line up. Everybody, put out your left leg. And one guy put out his right leg. The sergeant looks out and sees two legs together and says, all right, who's the fool that's got both his legs up? <laughs> you can't put both your legs up. You can't pull yourself up. David didn't go out there and say, hey, Saul, you just watch, man. I am the greatest slingshot expert you've ever seen. Wait till you see me, Saul. I have one cool dude. I, I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to whip. I, I'll tell you, I'm going to whip that stone right at that that Philistine. You're going to write him. You're going to write about me in the Bible. You're going to be so impressed. No, 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 no. He had no nowhere do you find David having confidence in himself. He has confidence in, look what God has done for me. Therefore, He will do. He had indignation about the loss. He had motivation because it was great reward if he'd overcome. But he needed to recognize how he was going to do it. He needed God to do it for him. God's not going to do it because you memorize 32 verses on faith. He's not going to do it because you've come to church all the time. 
God has to be recognized as your source of strength. If God can't put this together, you're not going to. If God can't put your life together, you're not going to. If God can't put the marriage together, it's not going to happen. Amen? Paul later will write this. He'll say, if God's for us, who can be against us? If God's for you. Let me give you some practical things as we draw this to a close. Some practical things that help David get to that point. Because I don't know about you, but, but I certainly want to get to that point where I quickly react to anything when the enemy comes to steal, kill, or destroy. I, I, I want to react quickly and step in and nip it in the bud and get hold of it right away. I find out there were some things that God was teaching him in his life that he called on that day. One was his experience. In verse 34, he's telling Saul this, Your servant had, has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from a flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of God. You've got to have some experience. That's what it's all about now, is getting the experience now for the battle out there. You don't want on-the-job training. You don't want your first word you ever hear about healing to be when the doctor just told you you have cancer. The time to get your health battles won is when you're healthy. Hey, have you ever noticed when you're sick you don't eat? Isn't that amazing? And, and, and what happens if you don't eat when you're sick? You get sick. Right. Absolutely. Same with the Word of God. Do you know when you're under pressure, you know what Christians don't want to do? Just read the Word. That's right. Oh, Pastor, I'm too sick to read the Word. <laughs> Pastor, I was too sick to go to that healing meeting. <laughs> Think about it. I was too broke to go to that financial seminar. <laughs> I was too down to go to that joy seminar. <laughs> Hallelujah. you got to have some experience. you have to have some... God, God just, just says, open your eyes. All the things in your life are just little things for you to learn because if you learn the little things, the big thing is no problem. No problem. How did David learn? He was out there as a young boy learning. He was learning. He had experience. But more than that, he had training. In verse 39 and 40, Saul had tried to put his armor in. He says, listen, you're going to go out and fight that giant here. Let me put my armor on you. And he puts his Saul's armor on and gives him Saul's sword. Here's little David, you know, I mean, 16 year old boy, I've been a shepherd boy all his life. Suddenly he's got what? Armor on. Amen? Can, can you imagine if, if the SWAT team was going somewhere and Dennis said, uh, he was told him, I said, I want to go. And Dennis says, You can't go. I says, Dennis, I'm equipped to go. He says, Okay, good. Let me put all this stuff on you. We know something right away. I don't even know how to wear it, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> now, Dennis, let me fight with what I can fight. I'll pray you run into the building. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis would say, okay, Pastor, that's okay. Yes. I trust your prayers. I don't trust your use of the weapons. <laughs> Does that make some sense to you? And, and, and David takes these off. He, he says, wait a minute, this, is, this isn't going to work. Verse 39 and 40. He says, I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. And then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, went off to face the Philistine. Why? Because he'd been trained to fight with a sling. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of people, you know, you know, over the years of ministry, who would kind of say, come on, you don't, you don't really believe that David, David, uh, you know, uh, killed that Goliath with, with a slingshot, did you? I mean, come on, slingshot? First of all, it wasn't a slingshot, it was a sling. Yes. Slingshot, you pull back and let go. With a sling, you get far more force because you're whipping this thing around. Now, well, other people will say, well, it was the Holy Spirit. No, I don't think it was the Holy Spirit at all. He was with him, but David was trained. You know, I mean, there you are with a sling, you know, and then you flip and the stone goes this way and the giant's that way. I suppose the Holy Spirit could grab that and send it the right way. You know, but a lot of us sit around, we don't do any training. We're just going to wait for the Holy Spirit to do something. No, David trained with a sling. What do you think he was doing out there all those as a little boy out there, man, you know, he was shooting, yeah, man, he was shooting those stones at rocks and stones. And what was happening? Every day he trained. He became better. I saw a documentary on what slings could do. You know, back in those times, there were armies that fought with bows and arrows, and there were armies that fought with slings. 
And this one man decided to see if he could learn to do it. And he was filmed. And it was absolutely amazing. He could stand on this side of the room and as far away as twice that distance to that wall, they could put up a big uh, board, one inch thick, and with a sling and a stone, he could go, go through that board like a board. There was so much centrifugal force that when he let that thing go, that stone would hit that wood and go right through it like a bullet. Splinter it and fracture it more because it's not shaped like a bullet, but absolutely go, go through. I sat there, first time I saw that, I said, huh, if a rock can go through a one inch thick board that easily, a skull is no problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he began talking about marksmen learning to do this. I mean, if that's all you had to do, if that was your job in life, you could get pretty accurate with this. Well, they thought that sling throwers could knock a flying bird out of the air. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's pretty tough. Any of you boys ever had a slingshot and tried to do that? Let alone a sling knowing when to release it. But the, they, can, they can hunt with those things. Mm -hmm. You know this idea of little things out there? Ding! <laughs> you know, Paul the Lewis and David, oh God, help me, oh God, help me. No, 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 he's been trained. God trained him. You throw that swing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again until you get so accurate you can aim that stone right where you want it to go. Christian, you train the Word of God. You speak it over and over and over and over until the Word of God coming out of your mouth is as sharp as that stone penetrates exactly right. You have the right word for the right time and you've used it so much you know exactly where to place it. My God meets all my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus and it goes right into that poverty situation and explodes it. Why? Not because you tried the word. But you did the word every day, over and over. You got words out of your mouth, out of your vocabulary. You never let your mouth ever speak the word death. It scared me to death, frightened me to death. I was starved to death. Because you realize your words are like stones in a sling. If you learn to use them right, they have the same effect on the enemy today as that literal physical stone did on Goliath. Training is what Christians don't want to do. I want to have the result, but I don't want to do the training. I remember going out for wrestling when I was back in high school. He said, Pastor, you don't look like you were a wrestler. I don't think my opponents thought I did either. <laughs> and I can remember getting out there and, and uh, you know, and, 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 and if, if, you know, going through all these exercises, you know, the practice for wrestling. One coach said one time it was, it was worse than football. And we do these bridging exercises. Man, you back up on your neck. You're rolling on their neck on the ground. You know, why? Get your, your neck would grow two sizes. Now, if you were 15 and a half, suddenly, you know, you got a 17-inch neck. None of your churches, your shirts fit. You know, you've been just rolling around on the back. You're doing these bridging at wise. That's good. The guy got you down, he couldn't get your shoulders down. Good. You're up on your neck all the time. Like, you're this big neck, you know. And man, that coach was merciless, merciless, you know. And, and, and I, I can remember, I won a couple of matches, but I've, I've shared this before. Then I'd get on the end of that, that wrestling match, we get ready to start, and I'd look at that guy, and I could see him. I mean, sometimes I'd always say, your match. <laughs> he wants it more than I do. <laughs> I could tell. He wants it more than I do. This is just an extracurricular thing. I'm going to go to college someday. I'm not interested in becoming a professional. I, I just said it was a good, cool thing to do to take a sport. And I, I took track and wrestling. If I couldn't beat you, I could run. You know? <laughs> And, and there I am, but I can see it in his eyes. That guy wants this. I don't want this. I want to go out on a date tomorrow night. There's a good movie plan. That's what's in my mind. All that's his in his mind is to devour me. You know, and I could see it, and I could I could honestly say, oh, you're a man, shut up. You know? And the only ones I won were guys like me who I could look in their eyes and say, They'd rather be on a date too. Yeah. Not a chance, you know. I mean, neither of us really want. We don't really want to hurt each other, you know. It's like this guy wants to hurt me, you know. And I didn't last long in because I found out what it was going to take to overcome that was going to be more workouts and more training and more workouts. And frankly, I'd rather ride my bike with <laughs> on Saturday than to go to Saturday wrestling practice. Training, okay. But see, when I got into the word of faith, I found out it's no different, but I want it. I want it more than I want. The devil can come and I look at him and I think, You're, you've lost already, devil. Because you see, I want the victory. 
I want the healing. I want those children back. See, I, I, I want that financial blessing. I, I want that answer to prayer. Devil, I want it more than you do. You, you're just in it. You know, you're just in it to harass me and see what you can do. But I want this. And because I want this, I'm going to do what it takes. And if i got to listen to tapes all day long, I'll listen to them. If i got to read my Bible all day long, I'll read it. Because you know why, devil? I want this. I want this. I'm not going to let you have it. I want this. And man, if I lose a match, I go back and say, Coach, give me some more lessons to do. Show me some more things to do. Because I want to be back out on that mat next week. And I want to look at him and say, All right, let's go again. And if he beats me again, I go back and say, Coach. He says, Do some more tough things. Okay, I'll do the tough things. Why? Because I want it. And the day's going to come when I, when I have it. You've got to go through the training. Go through the training. Recognition, indignation, motivation. That's, a, that's all vital. But with that experience, you've got to have the training in it. But then the final thing I want you to see is this. All of that only works with faith. <laughs> Verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, will deliver me. He will deliver me. Down in verse 46, he's speaking to Goliath and he says, You come against me with, with your sword and your spear and your javelin, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Verse 36, 46, This day the Lord will hand you over to me. This day the Lord will hand you over to me. This day, well, I wouldn't want to be so sure. Then you don't have faith. Well, Pastor, I, I sure hope this works. I don't know what I'm going to do if it doesn't. Well, you better start another plan because guess what? It's not going to work because you're not in faith. Notice that he spoke his faith. Sometimes people, when we're teaching, Don and I are teaching about speaking faith. This new thing called speaking faith. No, no, no. That's what David was doing. He was speaking and calling things that were not as though they were. And he looked at that giant and he said, you're coming at me with a spear and a sword. Yeah, those are real certain. See, it's Christian size to pretend that difficult <laughs> things don't happen. Of course they do. Someone says, well, Pastor, I, I need you to pray for me. What do you need? Well, I, I don't want to be negative. It's not negative to tell me what your need is. You know, if there's cancer in the body, the Bible nowhere says say it's not there. It never says say it's not there. If it's there, it's there. If you don't have money, that, that's there. If there's brokenness in a relationship, it's there. But what are you going to say about the truth? That's a fact. What are you going to say about the truth? The fact is, Goliath, you've got a sword and you've got a shit. That's the fact. But the truth is yes. that this day the Lord is going to deliver me yes. and I'm going to take your head off. Yes. And very interestingly, David didn't have a sword. Talk about calling things that are not as though they are. I'm going to, I'm going to sever your head today. This is the day I'm going to end it. This is the day I'm going to end it. And there's got to come a time in your life and my life when we build up our faith and we get our training going and we've got experience to count on when we finally look the devil in the eye and say, this is the day. I'm drawn a line. And as of this day, devil, that sin will no longer have a hold in my life. Because I decide it. Not because I'm waiting for you to do anything. I've decided God is going to deliver me. This is the day I step out of financial bondage. This is the day I step out of depression. This is the day I step out of being negative. As of, th That's a decision. See, stopping to be negative is a decision. It's not you try it. You come to a day where you finally say, this day the Lord delivers me from negative speech out of my mouth. And it happens. You want it. You believe in it. And you speak it. And suddenly you find out you're setting the pace. You're now not just sitting around listening. You're setting the pace. God is showing through your life to other people what He can do. Don't you get anything out of this? Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank You and we praise You for Your love. We thank You You've called us to be pace setters, giant killers, overcomers. And you've put within us a Holy Spirit-driven urgency. Father, we know, every one of us, we know that we're born again. We're meant to be more than we are. 
We know that we're not living up to our potential. We know that there's greatness locked up inside of each one of us. We know that our past is gone forever and we have a future out in front of us untouched yet. So I pray, Holy One, that this would be a day of decisions. I will no longer be who I was. I will be who God says I am. God's people said. Amen. Amen and amen. We'll turn to